welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of All Things Policy. I am Kingshuk Shah, a researcher at Takshila Institution. With me is Dr. Tripti Kumari, an assistant professor of chemistry at Gargi College, a constituent college of Delhi University. Today, we'll discuss women in STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, challenges and opportunity. Hello, Tripti. It's great to have you in All Things Policy. Hi, Kingshuk. Good evening. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Technology is key in today's world and for any nation to grow and lead the study of STEM is key. It not only gives a skill set that govern the way we think and behave, but it is the very foundation of all the frontier area of science, be it artificial intelligence, computing like quantum computing or the advances made in evolutionary biology. All those are part and parcel of it. So, but Despite this, the importance of STEM, if the irony is the importance of women, there are very few and they are at the periphery of STEM. So, Tripti, I will begin with the question, how young girls can be motivated to study STEM? Well, uh, you see the very fact that we are discussing and we want to now talk about things today in contemporary times to encourage or to motivate young girls to pursue careers in STEM brings us or indicates a very uh, pertinent thing to light, which is that did we actually do something wrong? Uh, we as the global society, did we actually do something wrong in all these years that today we feel that we need to encourage these young girls? I and mean, why is it not just normal for them to come and pursue a career in science? Why in the very first place we need to encourage them or to motivate them? So I think somewhere something we did wrong. And what I feel the that went wrong in the process was the fact that we continuously reiterated to them time and again that see, maths and science is not meant for you or you do not have the ability to excel in these fields or that these are fields meant or you know boys or your male counterparts will be able to perform better in these fields than you so better not get into those domains and why not pursue something more like literature or poetry not that i want to undermine any of those fields either but then why why we as a society we as parents as neighbors as relatives and sometimes even as teachers or even siblings we have told these this to our young girls to our young daughters time and again that see this is not for you this is a place which would require, you know, a long hours of working or it is a place which would require many years of investment. And so you better not get into this. Why don't you get into a field which is more oiled, better lubricated, safer, more comfortable, easier to take up. So by these statements, we have always been dissuaded. And that is where comes the reason why they need to be motivated or they need to be encouraged. I mean, if you look, for instance, in any household, you will see that, you know, a girl immediately being compared to her sibling brother and being told that, look, your brother is doing so well in maths while you are only doing good with drawings or only doing good with poetry. So why so? And this is not just a small instance. I mean, even the greatest of the great scientists, Sir C.V. Raman, who was then the director of Tata Institute of Science, Bengaluru, he refused Kamla Sohani, who had approached to take up a research position. He refused her immediately by quoting that she was a woman and he believed that women cannot be able researchers. So the fact that these gender stereotypes, these biases, you know, these are so ingrained into our system that today by saying such things, we don't even feel that we've done something wrong or we have said something wrong. I mean, I quickly mention an ACER report. ACER uh, stands for uh, Annual uh, Survey of Education Report 2010 to 2018 which said that these gendered perceptions negatively impact the psyche of girls and that these gendered perceptions uh, affect the performance of young girls in maths and science. And a TED talk in 2016 by Reshma Sojani, she said that we've gone totally wrong in raising our girls right. We have totally gone wrong in raising our girls right way because while on one hand we told our boys to be nurtured, our boys to be risk takers, we told them that you can go and do anything, anything that is challenging. We told our girls on the other hand 
to not do any such thing which is challenging, to not take up any risks. And we raise them with a bravery deficit. So Reshma Sojani has coined an interesting term, bravery deficit. And she says that bravery deficit is a very important reason for the under-representation of women in STEM, even in boardrooms, in conferences and whatever. So, I mean, you take any instance, you take a research uh, finding which has been proposed by a woman and people will take it with a pinch of salt or an innovative idea proposed by a female in a boardroom will be laughed at because somehow we are still fighting every day against those gender biases and at no. MIT in uh, 1900 and uh, in 1990s the faculty at MIT and this is not an Indian phenomenon that is why I'm quoting the situation of MIT when women had to actually press for equal space for equal pay for equal access to resources. So, I mean, this is a phenomenon. Women are, are, you know, fighting against it globally. And that is why I feel, to come back to your question now, because all that I said just until so far was to create an understanding as to why we need to motivate them in the first place. To now answering your question that how can we encourage or motivate them? So, the first point, which I believe is, you know, by targeted behavioral interventions, to curb these gender biases at every level, at community level, at parental level, at sibling level. So by doing such things, by allowing women to just be and to to allow them to just take opt for career options of their choice, I think that will be a very big uh, change maker in this process. And the second point by which we can motivate them is by telling them or narrating stories about Indian women scientists. Because you see, we, we've all heard about uh, Madame Curie, we know about Rosalind Franklin, we know about uh, Dorothy Hodgkin also, some of us would be knowing about her. But to know about an Ashima Chatterjee or a Janki Ammal or Darshan Ranganathan or a Kamal Ranadeev or a Kamala Sohni would tell these young girls, these Indian young girls and their success stories, how they, you know, because these women have raised from the same academic background, from the same social structure uh, which was imposed upon them. They have faced the same kind of uh, cultural mindsets. They have negotiated with those social mindsets. And uh, they have risen above these trials and tribulations to make a mark for themselves. So if we tell up our girl, young girls about these Indian women who did wonderful science, I think that will be a very wonderful way in which we can, you know, interest them and inspire them to pursue careers in uh, STEM. So I think those two points uh, would... Uh... Yeah, it's really fascinating the way you have said, you know, like uh, recently, like Professor Rangarajan, the director of ISC, even he said we lack women in higher position in academia. And I think it's a long history. You quoted about MIT thing, like I remember it, Something in happened in I am Ahmedabad long back. Like Kamla Chaudhary, she was one of the founding member of I am Ahmedabad, but she was denied the post of directorship only due being woman. Or for that matter, Padma Desai, like she was denied the tenure professorship, like from associate professor to professor at the Lee School of Economics only being you know like she is a woman. Someone told her like why you need that? Like why don't like your male colleague has a family? These are the unfortunately biases and stereotypes. Absolutely, absolutely. Very unfortunate, but but something which is very much existent and which is which is a part of our daily livelihood. I mean, our daily lives, we are facing it often and on and off and on and off. But it's very unfortunate, but very much there. Can you share your journey? <laughs> so, well, my journey, I think I was blessed and fortunate to have parents and to have a family where both my brothers were very motivating and encouraging for me to pursue science. So I say I consider myself really fortunate. And then my alma mater, Miranda House, uh, also gave me the wings to actually soar above this glass ceiling. But what motivated me to pursue science, if I could place it like this. So for me, science was always very fascinating because I did not have to believe what someone told me. Science was something which I could see I could experiment, I could do myself and then accept that, okay, if this thing is working, then I pretty well accepted that this is a fact. For me, it was like binary. It was or it wasn't. There wasn't anything in between. So that fascinated me. Somebody won't tell me that, okay, you have to believe in this. Why would I believe 
So I always had this sort of a personality where I would not accept anything just for the sake that somebody told me. So I would always question and I would always reason it out. And science was that way in which I could see, reason and only then believe. So that is what motivated me to pursue science. And I think for all women who pursue science, it's only that and passion. But today, like when I see myself, uh, so I have been teaching chemistry for the past around 10 years now. And I'm teaching quantum spectroscopy, which are considered to be not very easy uh, or, or they're considered to be very challenging topics. And when I see those lit up faces and I take a class of all female students. So when I see those lit up female students, their faces intrigued with this fascinating concepts of quantum chemistry and spectroscopy. I think, I mean, nothing can beat up that satisfaction. And I think that is my biggest motivation or my passion to continue doing science. The, some of our students have also been to the most premier institutes of India, which includes IISC, Bangalore, TIFR, Hyderabad, IITs, ICERs in India. And some of them have also flown abroad to Cambridge, to Iowa State, to Nagoya and doing great science. So I think somewhere down the line, I have in a way motivated them to pursue science. And that gives me a great sense of satisfaction. So... I know that you are interested in the history of science in India, especially the pioneering role women in science and technology in ancient India. Can you cite some of the illustration and some of their work they have done? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. In fact, Vedic India, since you've talked about ancient India, so Vedic India was academically, I mean, we were prosperous the other way around also, but academically also we were very prosperous. And uh, Vedic India promoted women, was very liberal towards uh, women folk in general. So th there was, a, I would use the term a Vidushi, which means a thinker, a philosopher, by the name of Gargi, who hid from the descendant of Maharshi Gan. And Gargi and a discourse of Gargi with Yagi Valki has been mentioned very uh, crisply in Brihadaranya Upanishad. So if you read that Upanishad, there is a wonderful uh, discourse going on between a male uh, philosopher by the name of Yad Balk and Gargi, who uh, represents the female philosopher and, you know, her constant questioning of him on various aspects to an extent that finally Yad Balk has to say that Gargi, I do not know beyond this and I raise my hands. So Gargi to me represents the spirit of questioning. Gargi to me represents the spirit of not taking anything which is told to me. Gargi represents the spirit of questioning, of asking the reason and accepting it only when one feels so. So Gargi is a very good example of a great philosopher, a thinker uh, of ancient India. And not to forget uh, Leelavati. So the wonderful mathematician by the name of Leelavati, who also happens to be the daughter of uh, Bhaskar Achar. Uh, Ilavati was a wonderful mathematician and she, in fact, she didn't even marry. So this I'm talking about Vedic India when a woman refuses to marry just because of her absolute love for maths. And today we tell, we dissuade our girls by saying that this maths is not your cup of tea. So I think it's high time we should get back into realizing what potentials our women have and what all great things that they can do. Yeah. So what are the challenges that women face in having a career in STEM, you know, like Normally, can you just illustrate a bit, like normally there are gender stereotypes, social and cultural factors, a lack of financial, parental leap policy. So can you just touch on all of this and explain in brief? Yes. Yeah, gender challenges that women face. So there are many, I believe. And uh, to start with, like I already mentioned, gender perceptions, which is a very big obstacle. But more than that, what I also feel is that this old boys club sort of a fashion that prevails across streams. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult for a woman, you know, to put her arms around a male colleague and say that, okay, let us discuss this at 8 p.m. over a cup of coffee. That, that is not, you know, that limits us. These are things which we won't find very comforting or which won't place us in very comfortable situations. Going out for late night meetings, I'm not saying that it's not right or it, it cannot be done or that there aren't women who are, aren't doing this. There are women who do this and who do it. But it's comparatively not as easy for a woman to go out at odd timings. It's comparatively not easy for a woman to interact with her male colleagues in the same fashion as her male colleague would do. So that I think this old boys club thing which exists is difficult for women to go about. 
to wrap our heads around because they, then it, it may have different interpretations to it and that doesn't go very nicely. Yeah, I will add to that as we are saying, I, I am reminded of, you know, like Anne Marie Slaughterhouse, the famous uh, Princeton professor and the first woman like director of state department. She was the director for policy in US state department. Like in her famous essay she wrote in Atlantic, she said, you know, like in the name of the essay, women can't have all. Like she was discussing while she was in a party at United Nations, she was and meeting all those important diplomat and head of the state. Far more than that, she was more concerned about her kid like who was in fifth grade and he was doing miserably in mathematics. And he is not going to school and sulking. So I think these are the ch challenges. I think one of the challenges because that is also important to have the support of the family. And when you are working at, absolutely, absolutely, at this and level, yeah, please continue. I mean, we've all seen that very interesting photo of a parliamentarian from abroad who was uh, nursing her baby when you know in the house. So I mean. It's not easy and it's not just the household, but there are many other things that keep on that need to be taken care of and that just cannot be left. And those are the things that challenge us in going and doing something at odd hours because we have to give a certain amount of time to our families, to our children and manage things back at home. So those are that is a very important challenge. Odd timings is not very comfortable for us. Again, I, I would like to reiterate the fact that it is not that we are not doing it, that we cannot do it, but it's, it's all about how easy or how far we can go in that. And then, of course, various social factors that I mentioned, which tell us continuously that we shouldn't be taking up job or we shouldn't be pursuing science because it would require like, you know, around seven to eight years of your life. So why not get married and land up into a system which is more lubricated, which is more oil? Or why not land up into a system which is more comforting, which is less challenging? So those kind of constant monitorings that we undergo daily on a daily basis, that's, that's another challenge I feel. Career breaks. So that's a fourth point that I would like to make. Uh, women undergo a lot of career, suffer a lot of break in their career, sometimes because of parental, like you mentioned, parental leave policies, or sometimes because of parents, sometimes because of their you know, partner, sometimes because they've had a child and they're not, health does not permit them to immediately get back to work. In the, they're not in the proper shape. They're not in the mental framework to get back to work very soon. So the career break that happens is another very big challenge that women face. And then bouncing back from there, it takes a lot of guts and takes a lot of courage and it's not easy. And then this notion that, you know, spouses working in the same place, women are always looked down upon if their spouses are also working in the same place. I mean, why can't women be just given credit for who they are and for position that they have achieved on their own? And why do women have to be tagged with their spouse that because... Her spouse was in this place. That is why she got that position. No, not necessarily. I mean, she could have got that position purely out of merit. But why do people fail to recognize that? I mean, if it is a man who goes out and gets a job in a university where her wife is working, we never say that because the wife was there, the man got the job. But we always say that because the man was there, the wife got the job. So such things, this happened to Darshan Ranganathan also pretty common in our lives, in women's lives, and these are one of the a few very big challenges that we face. Gender disparity, taking whatever findings that we make or whatever statements that we make a little less seriously, trying to shun us down, trying to cite odd hours for meetings so that we can be avoided. Those are the things uh, that, you know, that, that are challenging. We have to overcome them if we really want to get ahead. Tripti, like, what are the policy changes in societal and government level no, that would lead to greater women participation in STEM? Well, this is very important. We, like, we can't ignore this. If you ignore half of the population, women make the half of the population and their participation in STEM is key. So can you even talk about some of the major like policy changes as government or societal level that you think would help in bridging the gap? Yeah, absolutely. That's a very wonderful question. In fact, uh, in your introduction, when you mentioned that uh, the very few uh, women are Nobel laureates, uh, to that I would like to add that ever since its inception till date, we have only 16 Shanti Swaroop Patnagar awardees who are females. 
So now, I mean, look at the uh, starting disparity that we have. I mean, and this definitely calls for policy changes uh, or policy level changes at the state as well as at the central level. But apart from the societal changes that I mentioned, policy level changes at the government and the state level have to be done. But I would also like to mention here that the government today is doing a lot, in fact. Although nothing would be enough because we have to look at ages and ages of discrimination or disparities. So that cannot be curtailed down in a decade. But the government is actually taking keen interest and is has recognized gender disparities, gender bias as a problem and is making active efforts in the direction to curb it. So with the National Education Policy 2020 coming into picture, the policy recognizes the need for developing interventions to enhance the academic performance of girls. It believes that there do exist discriminations, there do exist biases, gender-based biases, and that they have to be addressed. So in the national education policy, which addresses to the school level I'm talking about, they have proposed a gender-sensitive training to teachers, a gender-sensitive training to parents, to stop them from making statements which uh, challenge or affect negatively a woman's uh, interest towards maths. They have also proposed for gender-inclusive funds and gender-inclusive funds to utilize community-based interventions. So maybe to work along with the community and not at the individual level, but to work along with the community to address this issue on a larger scale. And then we talk about research, then various and departments of the government of India, which includes uh, uh, DST, DBT, SIR, UGC, all these departments are uh, promoting women and they are take, making active efforts to promote women in STEM, in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, medicine also, by various research fundings. So CERB has a research funding by the name of POWER. POWER stands for uh, Promoting Opportunities for Women in Exploratory Research. So the CERB POWER grant is for women to encourage them to uh, pursue exploratory research. Then a very wonderful initiative uh, uh, by DST, the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, it's Gati Initiative. And Gati was proposed, you know, uh, considering the need for gender advancement in STEM, Gati was created. Gati stands for uh, Gender Advancement in Transforming Institutions. So Gati has recently come into picture and it is actually working very hard to bring a certain equitable space in institutions for women and recognizing women efforts and in working very constructively towards women pursuing careers, frontier areas in science and technology. So Gati, uh, the DST has come up with. Then there is another women scientist scheme by DST, which is especially uh, catering to women who have had breaks in their careers or who are currently unemployed, who did science but because of some reason are currently not in regular positions or not working in regular positions. So they have a women scientist scheme under basic and applied sciences, other humanities. I think there are three categories where one can look into that. And then the Department of Biotechnology has BioCare Research Grant to promote women scientists towards uh, career development in the in the field of biotechnology or biology based fields so those are certain research fundings that i mentioned about and there are a plethora of many many more and then uh, various women excellence awards women scholarships that the government is sponsoring to bring women to the fore uh, in fact uh, iisc has a special recruitment drive for women at various academic departments and at its various academic departments and centers where women who actually have that metal, who are, who are wonderful researchers, who are wonderful academic credentials can apply. So they have a special recruitment drive for that. So I think the government is making a lot of efforts at both the state level and at the central level. It is just for women in themselves to realize, to believe and to not to be uh, dissuaded by what X, Y and Z say and to believe that they have the ability to do anything, that they have the ability to pursue, uh, be it science, maths, engineering, medicine, you name it, and they can do it. So it is for us to believe the doors will always be there. And as the saying says, where there's a will, there's a way. So, Yeah, rightly said, Tripti. You know, you reminded me of 
Drew Foss, the former president of Harvard University. Like she said, we educate women because it is smart. We educate women because it changes the world. I think this is what it is the most important thing. Because there is a, you know, old African proverb. Like you teach a man, it teaches a man. But you teach a woman, you teach the whole family. So, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, I'll just conclude uh, myself by saying uh, that, you know, we recently celebrated the Women's Day, the International Women's Day. But what I feel, and I think I would be echoing the voice of uh, many women out there, that we are not out there to ask for a special day for us. We are not asking one particular day to celebrate us. We are just asking for, we are just not even asking, we are just wanting or wishing for an equitable space. We don't want a special status. We just want equity. We want, you know, the acceptance of the society that we are also very much there, that we also have the ability, the uh, the potential to do things, and that we also can be allowed to exercise our thoughts, our beliefs, the way everyone else is allowed. It is just that space that we are seeking and nothing more than that. No special status, no uh, special celebration. So I would just like to conclude with that and I would like to thank you. Thank you so much, Tripti. So with this, we'll end today's podcast. Thank you. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM Podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in.